I'm Libby Robin and my tribe is the history of science, but I have worked in most of my workplaces in interdisciplinary environmental groups, including science and humanities, and at museums. In the context of this event, we're, we're not just talking about the concept of the Anthropocene, which is pretty much defined by science, we're talking about encountering it. So we're talking about a personal response to the Anthropocene, and we're particularly talking about what the humanities and social sciences can bring to understandings of the Anthropocene in uh, our present world. I guess I like the term because it slightly moves the discourse away from crisis management to <coughs> reconceptualising our place in nature because we're at a unique moment where people are a force changing the world and we can no longer think of the nature of the world and the culture of the world as two separate worlds. We're putting everything together. And so the whole idea for me is that it's an opportunity to have conversations with science, which of course, if you're a historian of science, it makes sense. And also a conversation with business, a conversation with political leaders, a conversation with ordinary people. It's about democracy, it's about other things. Uh, so I think that the, the, the concept has the power to gather together more voices than has previously been the case. It's been coming out of hockey stick curves and uh, very technical information and actually I think we need to move it across and think of it as a metaphor and a way to think about how do we live. We're meeting here today not to discuss whether human activities are shaping the processes of the earth but rather to open up but, but rather to open up new possibilities for dealing with this reality. I've got light in my eyes, I'll have to do this, I think. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> we are, like it or not, encountering the Anthropocene at every turn. What does this mean for our society, for our global world, for non-human nature and for the world's poor? We're entering a new ethical space that demands a rethinking of human responsibilities to the planet itself. We are the artists and scientists, particularly in this gather gathering, people interested in the environmental humanities. We are actively engaged with the relations between humanism, or simply being human, and other forms of life on Earth. The Anthropocene forces us to consider not just life itself, but also the processes that support life. One challenge of the Anthropocene is to consider planetary futures in this new epoch. What sort of expertise will enable us to live and to adapt to conditions no humans have faced before? We cannot afford to lose hope for our species. We must have hope in order to act responsibly. We must aspire to future generations. If we follow Arjun Apadurai and take the future to be a cultural fact, we need more than nature and its experts to get us there. We need imagination, anticipation, aspiration, Undaunted by the probable futures that are generated by models of nature, models generated using the best science and technology available, none of which offers a lot of hope right now, we need to new find new ways to move towards possible futures. The future is not just a technical or neutral space, it's shot through with affect and sensation. None of our scholarship has been good at capturing the sensations of the future. Awe, vertigo, excitement, disorientation, Yet in the great acceleration of our present, the only thing certain is change. Rather than just measuring change in our world, we, we also need to discover what Apudure calls the specific gravity and traction of the imagination. It's imagination that can expand the possibilities for the future. C.P. Snow argued in his famous 1959 lecture that there was a cultural schism between science and the humanities, a difference in knowing that they meant a difference in knowing that meant they spoke past each other. While humanists were concerned about civilization and its roots, scientists became the voice of the future. They had the future in their bones, he said. The bones here echo echoed the apocalyptic and future-minded writing of Snow's time, where science provided the expertise for a future conceived in technological advance. The Anthropocene is a new era, and our group here is conceiving it as a project for the humanities, the sciences, and more. 
Snow's rather limited and very ivory tower two cultures will not be enough for this project. We need statecraft, business acumen, art and scholarship. And we need them all to respect each other if we're to find a way forward that's inclusive and less harmful to the planet. The future is no longer somewhere we go, it's something we create, in the words of Ian Lowe, former Australian Commissioner for the Future. It's something for which all humanity must share responsibility. A polarised view of the nature-culture divide underpins pride in the Western civilisations that set people apart and apart above nature. Now this civilisation finds itself deeply unsettled by changed circumstances where there is serious evidence that its own actions are causing that change. The world can no longer be regarded as merely biophysical. If there's no wild, no nature beyond the human footprint, this threatens our culture, our civilisation and our sense of selves. No wonder there's denial afoot in some circles. The image of the banker by Jason DeCare Taylor with his head in the sand while his world disappears underwater focuses our thinking for this event beautifully. An artist can create a picture like our banker image, which as the cliche suggests is worth a thousand words. Science generates its visual images using thousands of numbers. The classic images of the Anthropocene come from the scientific tradition where a set of incremental measurements is drawn together and the story emerges from the data. The J curves of the Great Acceleration are a set of 24 graphs presented in matching hockey stick format with a variety of variables such as population, wealth, globalisation and extinctions travelling fairly flat along the x-axis until about 1950 and rapidly accelerating up the y since. Don't worry if you can't read the detail, the point is the picture. Another striking image fr from science is the iconic pie chart of the safe operating space for humanity based on the parameters of life in the Holocene, the 10,000 year period during which most human civilizations have grown and thrived. The pie chart tells us that the planet's most significant changes in the Anthropocene are, in order, the loss of biodiversity, climate change, and the human manipulation of the nitrogen cycles of the Earth. The pie chart comprises variables measured by a range of environmental sciences, but each variable also has historical and cultural context, and the point of the chart as a whole is to consider life within the limits of most of the planet's human history. Numbers are also important in the economics of markets. Sometimes numbers are counts of actual things, for example, the number of people in the world, the average wealth, etc. But numbers are also based on proxies, on things we can count when we can't count the phenomenon directly. An example of this is counting the number of McDonald's outlets as a proxy for globalisation. Clearly such a proxy embeds a particular Western sort of capitalist globalisation. Globalisation can be, often be more subtle. Many global phenomena are not physically emplaced in the way a particular shop can represent. Stock markets and the internet are two powerful globalising forces, but each cannot simply be re represented through GIS positions on a map that can be imported into a J-curve. Numbers speak clearly to some people and alienate others. The Anthropocene moment can be represented by more than numbers. This is desirable when the numbers are grim. We need a range of voices from the developing world, from the artistic world, stories and numbers that together tell the physical changes of this moment and what they mean to the planet. The environmental humanities offer ways to critique dominant orthodoxies like the Western market system, a system often held up as a solution to the problems of the Anthropocene, yet also part of the problem. So what is the current state of the Anthropocene? The great acceleration in global change has led to dramatic physical changes. There's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, leading to global warming, limiting life's processes. We also have enormous social change. There are more people on Earth today than have ever lived before in every era. That's a really scary one. Most of all, we live in emotionally demanding times. We all le deal with rapid change all the time. Changing media, changing forms of communication, changing banking and insurance, changing transport and energy demands. We live in times of great wealth, better health, and in a planet with more food than ever before. Yet there's also great unhappiness and anomie, perhaps just as much in rich places as in poor. 
Tony Judd opens his 2010 treatise on our present discontents with the phrase, something is profoundly wrong with the way we live today. As a historian, I'm interested in what Judd figures as the new presentism of our present. He writes, much of what appears natural today dates from the 1980s. The obsession with wealth creation, the cult of privatisation in the private sector, the growing disparities of the rich and poor, and above all, the rhetoric which accompanies this. Uh, uncritical admiration for unfettered markets, disdain for the public sector, the delusion of endless growth. We cannot go on living like this. The little crash of 2008 was a reminder that unregulated capitalism is its own worst enemy. Judd is interested in social change. He's not particularly concerned with the future of non-human nature. But he's right to be concerned that what has so quickly become the default Western and global ways of living dates back only 30 years, to times just before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Since the 90s, we've seen an accelerating orthodoxy focusing on growth rather than sustainability in our modes of living, despite the fact that sustainable development was the touchstone phrase of that 1992 Earth Summit in Rio. The question for our meeting this week is how we might foster alternative thinking, new ideas that can sing up and re-enchant our lands for an epoch where nature is no longer beyond our sense of self. I'm borrowing here from an Aboriginal way of speaking about land, as Deborah Rose explains. When you walk the song lines of Australia, you need to respect the ancestors, to approach all places with sacred reverence. Relevant, reverence. The land is alive, and if you're an Aboriginal person, you belong to it. In Aboriginal Australia, there is already a deeply civilised approach to nature that does not assume that it is apart from humanity. Rather, humanity is folded into nature. Good manners and respect for country require you to call out and establish your presence wherever you go. When you enter new places, you need to be welcomed to country, as we were today, by ancestors, totems, landscape features, or neighbours with responsibility for that country. Country demands its own respect. In this brave new world, the ownership of the earth and its resources is entirely unlike Aboriginal relationships with country. The land, the sea, and the sky have become the mere chattels of wealthy persons and nations. We have a conservation movement that craves escape from humanity and its institutions. National park systems are celebrated as places without people, thereby further excluding those whose livelihoods depend on them. Wild nature is precious in the West, but increasingly wildness is a fiction and has to be managed to be protected aesthetically, if not actually, from the human influence. Nature is no longer separable from the traces of humans, and when it is wild, it comes as Hurricane Sandy or Black Saturday bushfires, beyond human control, but hardly offering human solace. This is what the era of the Anthropocene means. The atmosphere is full of the spoils of the Industrial Revolution. Fertilisers from the land permeate offshore reef reefs and kill life underwater. Ocean currents, as critical to life as the Gulf Stream, are approaching tipping points where they will abruptly change direction, at a point where the sea can no longer just absorb more and more of the heat emitted by Western lifestyles. Western cultures forced the rapid rise in carbon levels in the atmosphere levels that have alerted atmospheric chemists to name the Anthropocene as a new e epoch, as something never experienced before. There's no personal responsibility or ethic of land in a market economy. We're not even obliged to live in the houses we own. Ownership has replaced stewardship. Place is valued by markets. As Ch Tony Judd puts it succinctly, we know what things cost, but we have no idea what they're worth. Markets have no ethics. They are societal, but not personal. No one is ultimately responsible for what the market decides. The bucks never stop. They just keep cycling. Places die when their value is measured in dollars, which themselves fluctuate according to markets. As Sheila Jasanoff remarked, markets cannot produce knowledgeable and adept de democracies. Rumours and whispers send market speculation off in new direction, in search of wealth creation that has less and less to do with reality. The futures of lands are decided in faraway auction houses or in international courts of law. No one needs to go to a place to establish ownership. 
Markets feed markets, not people. As Jasanoff observes, they have yet to demonstrate they can deliver equality of opportunity, devise solutions for intransigent ethical conflicts, or develop a workable sense of a common good. Despite rhetorics to the contrary, modern markets depend on governments to create the stable background conditions they need for their very survival. The process of globalisation began accelerating in the middle of the last century, but by the 1980s, the market system itself began to present the illusion of ruling without reference to nations or international bodies. Market thinking now has profound implications for nature and for all life on Earth. This change is deeply cultural, yet somehow outside the realm of human ethics. It's a virtual machine that's been wound up and left to tick. The great acceleration of global change is driven by particular energy economies, a particular way of defining economy and the virtuality of the 21st century world, where we know all that is happening at once and have no time to think about any of it. By way of an example, I thought it would be good to talk about Bishop's Row, London, N2, where, I think, where luxury homes uh, sink under mould and control and crawl with rot rats. They're unvisited by their offshore owners. While most London residents cannot afford to buy the flat in which they dwell, an expanding population of homeless Londoners looks on in dismay. Margaret Atwood's portrayal of the moral dilemmas of life after the flood in her splendid 2005 novel, The Year of the Flood, are not so fictional, already in N2, perhaps. Such dereliction of both houses and duty of care accelerates disparity between rich and poor and sharpens the divide between the virtual market, reality, and lived experience in N2. It's not good for anyone. It's the crazy extreme where ownership and stewardship have become totally independent of each other. Places become reduced to a figment of global financial systems that themselves have no place on earth. Even the stock exchanges of New York, London, Tokyo and so forth are mostly just time zones, limiting the hours of virtual transactions. This dominance of valuing everything through markets has frustrated those concerned about the future of nature. Some ecologists, concerned that insufficient care is taken with managing land for animals and plants, have advocated creating new markets for clean air, clean water and good soil, for recognising nature's services in the market system. And this is very topical because Beijing, I think, is in its sixth day of extreme smog at the moment. If clean air and water are rendered invisible, Gretchen Daly argues, there's no value attached to biodiversity, to the animals and plants that help humans breathe and who purify water and enrich soil. The idea of ecosystem services, of regarding nature as a service provider, crucial to the functioning of society, has given rise to economic ways for valuing nature. But these still sit within old Western frameworks and ultimately are limited by the nature of markets themselves. Nature is still just what it is worth to society. There's no fostering of the relationships between humans and nature where an ethic of care might be nurtured. Ecosystem services that include the emotional importance of nature to humanity are difficult to measure or to make economic. The capacity to include the aesthetics of nature, which un undoubtedly motivates people to study conservation biology, remains unvalued and invisible to the ecosystem services model which was actually a last-ditch effort to save the environment, a 1990s initiative to enforce limits on damage to nature to save evolutionary future, perhaps, by ecologists trying to work within the system. The Anthropocene is a word of the next decade. It is, geolog it is a geological epoch and also an assertion that business as usual is not enough. We've come to the end of the environment as we've understood it since the mid-20th century. The great acceleration has made the environment untenable. In the remainder of this talk, I wanted to consider how we invented the environment and what we hope to achieve by its invention. The definition of the article is important. It's the environment. It was constituted as a problem and was to be solved as part of the spirit of post-war reconstruction. The invention of the environment created a demand for a particular expertise scientists who understood nature as a large system that supports human livelihoods. 
In the new book I'm currently working, writing with uh, Svaka Serlin and Paul Ward, The Environment, A History, we argue that the environment was invented in 1948. Dating from a key text, ecologist William Vogt's ap apocalyptic road to survival. Vogt's Jeremiah was a call for government, both national and international, to work within a framework of ecological freedom to the imper imperatives imposed by limited resources. If we don't give up the idea of nature without limits, he says, we may as well give up all hope of continuing civilised life. Like Gadarene swine, we shall rush down a war-torn slope to a barbarian existence in the blackened rubble. Cheerful stuff. <laughs> Vogt demanded a redefinition of human society and civilization itself in physical terms, rooted firmly in the earth. He declared that our place in the society of nations must be weighed against the scale of our total environment. Living beyond the resources of the environment spells the end of civilization. Defining limits defined the environment itself. This was an era of men where the power of man was much discussed. Three prominent wise men of the day are worthy of note mention here. The first was ecologist and ornithologist Max Nicholson, instigator of the Nature Conservancy in Britain in 1949, which is a body of scientists who were working for wildlife rather than managing land. Nicholson promoted a relational view where humans assumed stewardship for the environment. The second wise man was Forrester Aldo Leopold, whose posthumously published book, The Sand County Almanac, articulated a land ethic. This is 1949 a personal responsibility to restore land damaged by poor farming practices, particularly in the United States. The third and most globally influential was evolutionary biologist Julian Huxley, who formally institutionalised the responsibility of science to society in 1947. Science, education and culture became the pillars of UNESCO, a key United Nations institution that promoted post-war reconstruction, and Huxley was its first Director General. This era of questions about man's responsibility culminated in the Wenigren Anthropology Foundation Conference in Princeton, Man's Role in Changing the Face of the Earth in 1955. The event brought together 73 participants identified as global environment experts, among whom there was only one woman, the Indian plant geneticist, Edevalath Jamaki Amal. Led by prominent polymath Americans, geographer Carl Sauer, entomologist Marston Bates, and planning theorist Lewis Mumford, man's role explored geological history, oceans, freshwater, climate, soil and desertification, energy and resources, biotic communities, waste, urban and industrial development. It documented physical changes and growing human population and limits to the earth resources, and it culminated in a final chapter, The Role of Man. The idea that humanity was changing the earth was a call for responsibility for the environment, the environment, the physical other than human world that was the support system for all life, including human life. Man was more powerful than he knew and troublesome to the rest of the world. The predictions were dire, but there was still choice. Humanity could elect to take responsibility for the earth. This was a complex task, but with collaboration across a wide range of sciences, humanity might realign its civilizations and its aspirations to work within the physical limits of Earth. Such an expert vision rather excluded democratic processes. This was a new era of paternalist science for society, born in the awe-inspiring atomic age. The environment was born into a global moment and globalisation and environmental ideas shaped each other. As science became the voice of nature, it also moved into questions of civilisation. In 1949, Paul Sears, leading advocate for the United States Soil Conservation Service, wrote a new epilogue for Deserts on the March, his 1930s book on soil conservation and desertification. Like Vogt, he argued that the science of ecology was central to understanding and managing the environment. <coughs> ecology would provide a new basis for civilization itself. These are Sears' words. Conservation of our resources is not a subject. It is a moral attitude. There is a body of knowledge, a point of view, which particularly 
sorry, which peculiarly implies all that is meant by conservation and much more. It's at present neglected in most of our schools. It's been called by H.G. Wells, who cannot be accused of a failure to anticipate events, the science of prophecy. Certainly, it is the science of perspective. It is the basis of the philosophy of Jan Smuts, one of our greatest and most humane figures of our day. It is the approach to biological knowledge, which is called ecology. 1940s, very 1940s, and advocating ecology. The 1940s and 50s cultivated big ideas about science for society, for feeding the hungry world, which in included Western nations that had been at war for the first half of the 40s. A hungry world was not just developing. The first meeting of the group that became the Food and Agricultural Organisation, that's FAO, was in 1943, even before we had the United Nations, the parent organisation. Post-war reconstruction was about restoring civilization and dignity to a humanity torn by war. The post-war context for managing the environment was looking forward, planning globally, and developing a fairer world. The linking of soil and civilization, of ecology and ethical use of limited resources was widespread at the time. Australian writer Eileen Mitchell, well known for her Silver Brumby children's books, also wrote a book for grown-ups in 1946 uh, called Soil and Civilization. In this, she sought to retrieve the land for the sake of civilization as we know it, which she feared would be gone under the tide of man-made des deserts. The dust storms of the dirty 30s were literally life-threatening. The dust clouds are carrying with them the material that should be taking the shapes and forms of life, Mitchell wrote. Alison Bashford's new book, Global Population, argues persuasively that population was the world's big question for much of the 20th century, but eugenics was a difficult science. Eugenicists argued for a planetary consciousness that embraced concerns about soil fertility as well as birth control. But it was in the post-war years when extreme eugenics and determinism were exposed as inhumane and uncivilised that the environment began, became the language for global managers. The environment was wrested from the difficulties of determinism and fascism by becoming ecology, a holistic but knowledge-based science, and by becoming directed away from people towards land and resource management. The hyper-separation of people and the environment was necessary because people in the post-Nazi moment were so difficult to manage. Thus, the environment was defined without them, to be managed by scientific expertise. Many of the global projects of the new United Nations were driven by a focus on environmental needs to rebuild the world. Newly independent nations such as Israel and India were prominent in the leadership of arid zone science projects, for example. Feeding the world, or what we today call food security, was a great, one of the great concerns of the Malthusian Le League. The question originally posed by Malthus, where is fresh land to turn up, still hung in the air despite a long 19th century history of scientific work to improve the productivity of land. Fertilisers, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, could make land more productive as the 19th century discoveries of German ch chemist Justus Liebig had demonstrated. It was not just the extent, but rather the productivity of land that was crucial. Demand for superphosphate fertiliser drove a voracious 19th century trade in guano. That's bird poo. Uh, experimental agricultural science spread throughout the British dominions based on the model of Rothamsted Agricultural Research Station north of London, established by Liebig's student J.H. Gilbert in 1843. This pattern, where the responsibility for restraint is vested in scientific understanding, but the pressures of Western expansion and the pursuit of wealth continues regardless of the results, has persisted to today. The invention of the environment was just one of the social experiments whereby science was deemed to be useful to society, but when the advice came, it was ignored if it was unpalatable. The science was confined to nature and could always be trumped by the politics of people. Fertiliser could only help land so much. Just a brief sketch of the 1940s ideas about soil and civilization is enough to see how human interference with the nitrogen cycle has become one of the three problem red wedges on our pie chart. So, if we are to seize the Anthropocene opportunity fully, we must ensure we do not simply reduce the future to climate, to use Mike Hume's apt phrase. Climate is the second most important. In fact, extinctions are a bigger problem. 
People may never have caused climate change before, but they have certainly lived through it. People living in Australia 19 to 26,000 years ago experienced the last glacial maximum where sea levels were 135 metres below where they are at present. Aboriginal people lived through the end of this period where water levels rose quickly and steadily, eliminating about a third of the land of Sahul, the larger continent that included our continental shelves and New Guinea and Tasmania. They adapted. But they did not have to deal with the loss of real estate in the way our markets now define it. We need models from beyond the recent past, beyond the technologies of the Western present that might suggest different ways to live in a world under climate change. The metaphorical power of the Anthropocene suggests ways to transform the future even as humanity is forced to relinquish the conceit that it has control or ownership over nature. The environment was born with apocalypse and crisis continues as the mode for environmental discussions. Science has been prominent in defining and managing the environment as well as being a powerful voice for Earth's future since the 1950s. But as we encounter the Anthropocene and move literally out of control, we bring new varieties of scholarship to environmental thinking. In about 1962, scientists from various disciplinary backgrounds began to collaborate and identify themselves as environmental scientists. Soon after, environmental engineering added itself to the expert mix. But it was not till the 21st century that we saw the emergence of ecological and environmental humanities to grapple with the affective dimensions of the relations between human and nature, humans and nature. The environmental humanities were conceived for a time when probable futures are grim. They are not really about new experts, rather about moving humanity beyond thinking in terms of statistical probability to enable creative and democratic possibilities for hope in the future. The most urgent task as we encounter the Anthropocene is to engage a wider public and polity, not just experts, in imagining and embracing humanity's entwined future in nature. Thank you. Thank you.